So I've always been an artist ever since I was a kid, always was drawing and painting and just doing all sorts of creative stuff. Uh, but what really uh, sparked my flame in terms of art was uh, when I got into doing graffiti. Um, so a little bit of a rebellious side to myself when I was in high school and uh, something about graffiti really just sort of uh, spoke to me and kind of captivated me and uh, it really just accelerated my enthusiasm for, for visual arts. I think it's just the, uh, the, the, the really high learning curve. I think it just, it just takes so much practice and time and dedication to kind of see it like some positive results. So I've been doing this for over 15 years now and I finally am starting to feel a bit more confident in my abilities. So it's, it's been a long journey, but I think that's what really like fuels the, uh, fuels the passion as well. So the mural came about because of a referral from another township that I actually painted in. So a few years ago, I painted in a mural festival in a small community called Minto. Uh, so more specifically in a, a town called Harrison in Minto. So um, the, a, a person who worked for Bolton um, was actually also in contact with those folks over at the township of, of Minto. And so they referred me uh, to the Bolton people. And uh, then the mural came about through, uh, through that. So actually, this pro process to create this mural is actually very, very seamless. So after I came up with the concept of the Humber River piece, I presented it to the, uh, I guess, the board of who, who would be approving the design. And they had absolutely no negative feedback. All of them were, were like so thrilled for it. So yeah, it was really easy. I, I didn't have to make any revisions. And then we just executed the mural and it was, it was pretty much flawless. So this little guy here is my favorite part of the mural. and. Uh, I think it took me about five or six hours to paint him. So it was really fun to see him come together over those five hours and uh, see all those little details really come through. And um, yeah, so I think, you know, he turned out he turned out fantastically and is my favorite part. That's why I put him right in the middle of the, of the piece. My inspiration for this piece comes from the Humber River, which is right beside where the mural is located. Um, so I just did some research online, found that, you know, the Humber River is just a host of, to so many different like forms of wildlife, animals and plants and stuff like that. So I really wanted to pay tribute to that. And uh, so that's where, uh, yeah, that's where all the inspiration came from for this piece. So as you know, I started off as a graffiti artist and that's kind of what like propelled my love for visual art. And uh, I know that there's a little bit of a negative stigma around graffiti, even though it's becoming a bit more accepted now. But I just wanted to kind of highlight like this all comes from that like uh, tr you know, troubled youth in the past, and so I just wanted to highlight, like, you know, don't kind of discredit those troubled youth. Maybe try and help support them, as uh, you know, they could end up being the next uh, great artists of our generation. So, yeah, you can find out uh, more about my art and my portfolio online. So I have a website; it's blazeworksart.com. I also have Instagram; it's just at blazeworks. And uh, yeah, so between those two, it's easy to find some of my work and get in, co in contact with me as well. first started painting I didn't do any of that I just like started painting and I of course look back at my old work and I cringe but uh, I definitely had the inspiration I just lacked the technical knowledge and over the years I've gained the technical knowledge and now I teach the technical knowledge to other people but I would say they're equally as important because if you're trying to follow this joy and, and that's going to lead you to these things that you're meant to paint and that excite you and that are going to make you fall in love with art, you might not be able to execute it properly if you don't have the technical foundation, right? And you might get disappointed and then discouraged and then you might stop. So I think I would say have a balance of finding your inspiration and your joy as an artist and following that, but also hunkering down, learning, taking some courses. Uh, my name is Ricky Shade and I am an artist. I love painting, drawing, sculpting. Uh, I work as a fine artist. I exhibit and sell my work. I also work as an art instructor and as the manager at an art studio in town here. Every once in a while you gotta take a step back. 
there's a few different styles of art that I make usually. Uh, a lot of it is very fantasy based, but then I also love doing wildlife art, like realistic wildlife art. Ever since I was a kid, I've always loved animals. I loved like my stuffed animals and going to the zoo and learning about animals. I wanted to be a marine biologist or like a scientist. And uh, I was always fascinated by animals. And so a lot of my inspiration comes from nature. And then another one of my big sort of things I loved growing up was fantasy, like the Lord of the Rings and the Aragon book series and uh, Wheel of Time and all these different fantasy series also fueled my imagination. So I kind of, a lot of my work is like animals, but almost like in a storybook kind of scenario where you could almost see like a story happening with elements of fantasy and kind of like magic and uh, lots of like glowing lights and things like that in my work. So definitely a lot of it is from nature and also from the fantasy that I was exposed to growing up. And then also now like living life, every new life experience is like fuel in the fire or I often think of it almost like a garden. So my creative mind is like this garden and what's mostly growing in the garden is all those seeds that were planted when I was a kid, right? That have grown into these big structures now, but still new seeds are being planted, new water and fertilizer is being poured on the garden from different life experiences. So a combination of nature, childhood and everyday life greatest memories of my own childhood were my dad showing me painting and so my dad was like an art or is an artist as a hobby right and when I was little he would set me up with like a little tile to paint on and show me about painting and he would draw things with me and stuff like that and those were always my best memories as a child was making art with my dad and so that's definitely why I love teaching so much because I, I see those memories being formed in the kids that come to my classes and it's a really great way to build confidence in children. A lot of children lack confidence and when they come to an art class and see that they can make this cool thing, it builds confidence and that confidence leaks into all other areas of their life, makes them better socially, makes them better at school, gives them these beautiful memories that maybe one day they'll look back on and think, I really loved those times as a kid making art with Ricky. For me, the act of creating something is just like really beautiful and sacred almost. It's almost like a spiritual thing for me. I'm a pretty like skeptical and, and rational person uh, now, but definitely when I was younger, I was a lot more of like a hippie for sure. And a lot of my motivation was very spirituality based in making the artwork and it still is. I'm just a little bit more grounded now, but to me, the act of creating something is, it's like connecting to like the creative energy of the universe. I really feel when I'm making a piece of art that it's like, there's one part of it that is me making the piece of art, but there's this whole part of it that's not me. It's like this other force that I'm like pulling from and taking from, and that's kind of moving through me. Like I'm never in total control of it. So for me, like what motivates me to make the art is, that connection to like what I'll call the creative spirit of the universe and also it it almost feels like a lot of it is like journeying through my subconscious mind the way the images come through sometimes is very intuitive and not super planned out so sometimes like it, it almost feels like I'm learning who I am better through making the art and exploring my own mind so that's another really motivating factor and I just think, yeah, it's also a lot of fun. I love doing it for fun, for the spiritual reasons I described. And also I love the craft of painting and drawing and I love getting better at it and learning more about it. And I would be lying if I said that receiving praise for my art was also not a motivating factor because I love people saying, whoa, you made that or like, that's amazing. It makes me feel good. So. That's definitely another reason. So I would say all those things combined. And at this point now, it's like my whole life is based around this art. And it's like I've got this studio here. I have no excuse not to do it. It's just like a part of who I am now. And I'll never stop. Like there's no way I could stop. I can take little breaks, but I'll never stop. It's like at this point, it is who I am. So 
no matter what, it's gonna be happening. So if you want to learn more about me and my work, you can visit my website, www.rickyshade.com. On Instagram, I'm Ricky Shade. On TikTok, I'm rickyshade.art. And I think that's it for my social media on Facebook, uh, Ricky Shade Artist. So go follow me, visit my website, check out my work. I've got lots of stuff up there for you to see. joy. Um, there's nothing I would rather be doing than painting. So I'm Lois Howick and this is my home studio or as I call it my playroom. Um, I've been painting basically with acrylics although I try different mediums from time to time but I revert back to acrylics usually and I started about 50 years ago but that was a very simple little project, um, but I realized it, it's very hard to find classes back then uh, to learn how to progress with my paintings. And you paint it like color book painting. Um, oh. So you're painting in between all the chalk lines. And then when it's all done and paint's dry, you just take a damp cloth and wipe all the chalk off hmm. and the black comes through where the chalk oh, was. Wow. I used to be with the Region of Peel Social Services for 30 years um, and my oldest daughter has gone into social work and she's working for a nonprofit uh, company out in Kingston um, and when I, she was on the CBC and I had put it out on Facebook and one of my ex-co-workers that I used to work with said, oh, it's so nice to see your daughter following in your footprints. My other daughter became a photographer and she's worked for a couple of photography companies. The one she's with now, they have a very unique process where they'll do your photographs and then they oil paint over them. Uh, I think it's oil or it could be acrylic, I'm not sure. She's now the painter of these family uh, heirlooms <laughs> and and she was telling me she said people are always asking me where did you learn to paint she said well my mom's a painter when I was growing up she used to teach classes and I used to teach them in the basement uh, and I used to join in some of those classes so I guess that's where I learned was from my mom I thought wow both my daughters have picked up on what I did in totally di different directions but Yes, it, it definitely has a, an impact. And when my grandchildren come, even there, they come down here all the time to look at what have I done new? Um, and can I have this one? And can I have this one? And they take home all kinds of paintings. So their house is full as well. Um, and yeah, even my husband, I mean, I know he knows where to find me. If he can't find me, come down here. He'll probably find me. But I don't like visitors. I'm usually like, what do you want? <laughs> Go. I can't paint and talk at the same time. Um, yeah, I just got to get in the headspace and keep going. And you get so excited about the next step that you just want to go, go, go. Mainly just by, by looking. Like, occasionally I'll buy... Um, a photography magazine, a nature photography magazine, because you get some good honest shots in there. Um, where else? Pinterest, um, I go in there, which is nice because I, I can save a collection. So the next time I wanna paint, I'll go through the, those. And whatever sparks, it's like, oh, it, there's a click. And you think, that's what I wanna paint. That's I may go through hundreds of ideas, and, and go, mm, I like that, but I'm, I'm not in the mood for that. But one will click and it's like, 
then I can't sleep at night. It's like, I gotta start it now. <laughs> I guess it's just, it's the feeling I get when I'm working on a piece and, and especially when I'm finishing it. Um, I usually find with a, with a subject, when I first see it out in the woods or whatever, you kind of, it takes your breath away. And there's, there's that second like, oh, I wish I could paint that. Um, and then when you come back and you try and you use your memory to try and create it, and it starts to give you that same feeling that you felt out in the field. Um, and you just want to build on that and build on it. And I just get a lot of satisfaction of watching the painting grow um, as you're adding layers and layers and glazes. And um, yeah, it, it's, it gets me excited. I can go on and on. Um, I, I find these days I can't, I used to come down at like nine o'clock in the morning and at four o'clock I'd be going, what's for dinner? I haven't even thought about it. Now I find I can do two or three hours and that's enough, I have to put it away, but it's really hard for me to quit. I don't want to quit, but I know the next day my back's going to be aching because I can't sit relaxed. I'm right up at the board um, and it gets, it's, it's just hard on my back. But um, I used to paint a lot more than I do now because um, I love it and it's exciting. And they, these are my magic wands. Like, they really are the things you can do with brushes. Um, it's not just a paintbrush. It, it creates so much the way you hold it, um, how much paint you put on it. it it's, uh, it's fun to play with them. It really is, it's play for me. I'm always happy when I'm painting. I don't like to be interrupted. <laughs> um, just let me paint all day and I go to bed content, thinking about my work and what can I change tomorrow in that painting. Um, yeah, it's, it's just the joy it brings me. And the joy I see in other people too. Um, when I, I, I just had a, a, a real flow of sales over at the library and I was just blown away thinking those people are spending their hard earned dollars to hang my work up in their house. That's a real accomplishment for me that someone would think enough of my work. I mean, I love my work, but that doesn't mean everybody will. Um, but those people invested in me um, and that makes me feel really good too. You know, another sign about the story, uh, there's a story to each one of these paintings. Mm -hmm. um, that one is an example. I had, when I was about 10 years old, I had a, um, a small booklet uh, which is really propaganda during the war. And that was one of the pictures in it. And even then, when I saw that, I thought, I've got to paint it. You know, and it's taken me 60 years. <laughs> I guess the challenge of, of drawing and painting um, any subject, anything from landscape to animals to objects, etc., etc., rather than just one, one aspect. Um, and to pr produce a piece of artwork that I'm satisfied with it and hopefully others are too. Um, realism is, is really my artwork right now. I'm a, a traditional artist. I, I like to try and paint what I see um, to the best of my ability so that somebody would appreciate the accuracy and maybe the composition enough that they would think that it would be good to put on the wall rather than use it as a doormat. <laughs> Most of my artwork is, is based on things I've seen or where I've been um, personally. So I, I think each one of the artworks uh, has more of a, an interest to it or uh, better yet, it has a story behind it. Um, I think that makes it a lot more interesting when 
you're talking to people and they stop talking about your artwork. Um, yeah, I think I'm inspired really um, by the ability, I'm mean, luckily enough to have the ability to, to do some of this stuff, which is so contrary to my profession, which is uh, aerospace uh, design engineering, which is totally opposite to, to this stuff. I also feel that any, anything I look at uh, could be look at, looked at as a painting. Um, not necessarily that it would be a painting, but I can see certain aspects of something that uh, you could make into a painting if it was interesting enough. Um, I guess to some extent it's the same as uh, in engineering when, when you look at a mechanical piece and in my head I think uh, how it was made and, and what makes it work. So it's a sort of similar similar process. Um, and sometimes I give up, I don't know what it is. So. <laughs> Well, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Um, as long as it gives somebody pleasure and they admire uh, what you've done, the precision that you've used, and uh, what it takes to produce an artwork, uh, which is, I mean, an artwork can take a day or it can take a, a year for the same piece of artwork. And everybody says, how long does it take you to paint? You can't, you can't answer things like that. So I think one of the important things for me is if I get a commission work and somebody wants me to paint something, uh, it's encouraging because they obviously know I can do it. Um, but at the end of the day, when, when you've got the finished product, uh, it's important that uh, the finished product is exactly what they expect it to be. And that's the most important thing, I think. Um, one of the things, I guess, uh, is difficult uh, is with ex exhibitions. Exhibitions take an awful lot of work, uh, heavy work, and setting things up and tearing them down, etc. And it's encouraging when people actually stop and look at look at your work and maybe talk about some of this stuff. That's where the interest comes in with the stories behind some of these artworks. And some people get really interested in it. Um, other people just walk past you and don't even know you're there, and that's the so <laughs> not very encouraging, but uh, that, that's the name of the game. That's what you have to put up with. <laughs> um, I think the only other thing is uh, taking a mental note, somebody taking a mental note of, of your work um, and possibly uh, recommending it. Stephanie and I'm Jamie and we're the water safety team from the town of Orangeville. We're here today to talk about life jacket safety. Did you know that more than 500 Canadians drown annually during the months of May and September due to not wearing a life jacket? One of the biggest factors is people going out during these times on boating, camping or canoeing trips and not knowing safety about life jackets. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what to wear out on the lake, how to put it on and some factors you need to know. My co-partner here, Jamie, will talk a little bit about it. So there are two different types of life jackets. There's life jackets and there's PFDs. PFDs are more common. That's generally what you'll see when you're um, out and about on boats or at pools or things like that. Both are excellent options. PFDs are more comfortable to wear and they only work when you're wearing them. So a PFD is more common because it's more comfortable to wear. A life jacket, Steph, do you mind holding that up? So a life jacket has to be bright colors. That's so we can see you when you're in the water. And a life jacket has all of its flotation at the front or around the head. And this is to turn you so your face is facing up and out of the water to keep your airway out of the water. A PFD just has flotation in the front and the back. So it will keep you floating at the top of the water, but it will not flip you um, face up. <clears throat> To put a, before you choose a life jacket or a PFD, you want to make sure that there's no fading in the color, there's no rips or tears, the buckles are all working properly, um, and that you're reading the label on the inside of the life jacket to make sure it's the appropriate size based on your weight. When you put it on, 
You're gonna make sure that all the buckles are working properly. They're tight and that you wanna make sure that your life jacket isn't too loose, that it's gonna ride above your ears when you get in the water. So if you pull up on the shoulders and it goes above your ears, it's too large and you need a smaller size. Light, uh, PFDs can be any color. Um, preferably you wanna get one that's bright so people can see you when you're in the water. One of the other major facts of life jacket safety is not knowing where to buy them. Most major retailers do sell them. Canadian Tire, Walmart are two great places to find them. We do advise to be careful of buying life jackets that have lots of prints on them. So sometimes there's cartoons and stuff like that. Also making sure that you read the inside of your life jacket to know that it's worth the proper size and weight for your child or yourself. If you do find that anything is faded on the inside and you're not able to read it anymore, it's time to dispose of the life jacket and remove it. We also ask that you don't alter any of the buckles. So re-sewing on clips or only being able to use one clip, your life jacket is now voided and will not support you. So make sure to check these factors before putting on your life jacket every time you go out to the cottage. So remember, life jackets and PFDs only work when you're wearing them. So children and adults should always wear them when they're in, on, or around the water. Um, if you're unsure of what your life jacket size is, please feel free to come by one of our pools. Right now our Tony Rose pool is open and we can fit you for a life jacket so you know you're getting the proper size when you buy one. Um, we offer many different programs including lane swims, public swims and swimming lessons all throughout the year. Um, you can give us a call or find more information on our website at orangeville.ca. And also make sure to have a water, water safe, safe day. day.